Let's get specifically into your DNA. You've tested with uh, most of the big players, have combined their various strengths to reach conclusions. The bottom line is you have very early indigenous British, Irish and European DNA. And most of your American ancestors were early settlers. So your DNA is mixed significantly as a result of that. So let's start with your American history and work our way back. Uh, this is a map of your ancestry DNA matches back to your great-great-grandparents. It's classic American frontier stuff via the East Coast ports and this, uh, the wagon trails, uh, which carried the bravest and most adaptable of them into the interior. We can actually see where you started out. The earliest uh, is focused on upstate New York, Massachusetts and Connecticut. Yes, back to Plymouth Rock and all that, but I haven't fully investigated uh, those ancestors, so I don't know if you can lay claim to a bear from the Mayflower or anything like that. But um, if you remember the movie Last of the Mohicans, um, these are very much the settlers of Upper New York, with Iroquois Nation as neighbours and British, French and later American military force spread throughout that area. Until after the War of 1812, in fact, uh, your ancestors around here would have had to have been very capable of defending themselves. Going back to your written report, you can see how your ancestors moved over time. This is based on census data and records rather than DNA. Your Great Lakes ancestors definitely saw some serious civil war action, but unfortunately we ran out of time to investigate that further. Uh, a generation or two later, after the Great Depression, your grandparents largely headed for sunnier climes. And this is where we depart from your American story and focus on your deep past, beginning with your German ancestors. Ancestry really didn't have anything useful to say there, um, but 23andMe is much more interesting because we know that your great-great-grandmother on your mother's side was born in Schleswig-Holstein and her husband was born in Pomerania. Now, the census from 1920 in Wisconsin is the only one I've seen for your family that includes German regions, and that's probably because Wisconsin was the favourite destination of Pomeranian Germans. Now, you can see Prussia here in blue. It united uh, Germany for the first time in the 1870s, but let's step back well, over 2,000 years. Um, this is Rome basically at its height, um, around 280 I believe. Uh, you can see this area here. Uh, this is where now these German tribes, the Saxons up here, um, it had expanded cli massive climate change uh, and overpopulation. Uh, so the German tribes expand over this entire region. Um, the, the Romans pushed back and took this area here basically, so you can see it here. Um, this area here became a Roman client state, which in interestingly pretty much corresponds with uh, with your German DNA according to 23andMe. Um, now if you step further back, this is more like 20 AD, something like that. These are the areas which became the, the Roman client states. These guys all became Roman soldiers, or a lot of them, and uh, your Saxons up here were mercenaries who were part of that. Um, and uh, basically, these are your British client states of Rome. That was the entry, this was the, the, the front door into Britain for the Romans, which we can see in this animation. So these are those client states, and they're slowly turning imperial red, well, it's actually more purple, uh, as the, the Roman influence spread throughout Britain right up into Scotland, but eventually a wall being built here. And here's your, your DNA. So this is your biggest chunk of uh, genetic material in present-day England, and uh, this is what we've just been talking about, the roots that the, the Romans took with their uh, Saxon mercenary uh, accomplices and uh, those newly uh, conquered Germanic peoples of western areas of Germany. So they, they came through here. Um, and I suspect this is your primary uh, genetic material in this region. It's not British. British here, British here, British here, British here. Um, these are the people pushed to the western edges by that Roman invasion. Uh, and you might be asking then, well, why does this map look so massively different from uh, Ancestry and also 23andMe? Well, I would say it's because although Ancestry has wonderful uh, British genetic information and has just updated their map, um, uh, your DNA is so old that uh, there's been lots of mixing. You've got the earliest people coming from here and here and here uh, rather than th the latest and they've mixed in with the British populations uh, living elsewhere on the island and, and that's why um, Ancestry hasn't picked it up uh, specifically 
and uh, 23 and me well it says your your guys are in the the main cities uh, but primarily i think it's because that's by definition where the most genetic mixing is so that is where they put two and two together and got five or perhaps it's me who's doing that i don't know now interestingly i'm going to point out that your vikings who are who are later on and what we're primarily talking about here um they were were also very different peoples just like these guys down here they changed over time so the Norwegian or the Norse Vikings, they primarily went to the north of Scotland and to the west of Ireland. Uh, the English Anglo-Saxons, who are unique pretty much in the UK, uh, all came from the people we've been talking about in Denmark, the Angles and also the Saxons. And uh, your Swedish uh, Vikings, well, they went in here. So that is where your um, your DNA comes from, uh, your Germanic DNA or ancient DNA from here. So there's been a bit of mixing there as well so that primarily explains the origins of these various groups uh, and just to get back to how early your dna is the reason why we can see that is because again you're coming in via the uh, the saxon route here um, which as you can see from this map is the earliest right so these are the roman uh, mercenaries and the others we mentioned uh, who who settle after rome collapses they come back and then there's the later migrations of peoples who by that point are very different and you know i think this uh, sums it up quite nicely you can see where your saxon uh, ancestors came through this part of england and there's the jutes here and there were jutes over here um, and uh, look at your dna no wessex dna no mercian dna no east anglian dna so you know clearly your ancestors were avoiding these people even though uh, those kingdoms ended up uh, merging together into England and the reality is uh, that all those early kingdoms um, were the way they were because of the different periods in time that uh, they arrived. Now one of the most fascinating is Elmet in South Yorkshire uh, where you, okay not a huge amount of DNA, 5.2% but it's really important. These are, this is a really ancient kingdom. These guys survived way longer than any of the other British kingdoms against all the various incomers um, and um, you have uh, DNA from there which uh, it is British and that whole area is associated with uh, King Arthur as are Cornwall and Wales where your other primary uh, DNA in the English part of Britain uh, and Wales of course come, come from. Talking of Wales, um, this is Mercia, one of the, the, the most dominant English kingdoms up until about the 10th century when Wessex came to dominate and the two of them along with the others eventually formed England. Um, they built this dike along uh, what is Wales effectively and that is why Wales is Wales and the Romans built this wall which is why Scotland is Scotland. Um, and those are basically the stories of uh, your English DNA and now we're moving into the part of your DNA which straddles Scotland and England, Northumbria, one of the oldest uh, English kingdoms. I'm not going to say too much about this area, partially because there's just so much to say that we'd be here all day, but uh, genetically, uh, basically the Scottish borders, Strathclyde, former kingdom, um, Cumbria, what was called the Old North after the, the Romans left and the wall began to rot and uh, people took all the stones and these guys were fighting each other all the time but they were also interrelated. So I'm going to focus on the, the northeast of Scotland first uh, which is where uh, the Picts had one of their primary kingdoms. These guys were part of what was left of a megalithic stone building culture which is, is basically believed to primarily have come in from the north of Scotland uh, probably from Anatolia uh, or somewhere in that region. Uh, and they've spread south and they know that because the, the, they've dated the circles and the, one of the best ones is is here, Callanish, um, which is very interesting. There is a, a, a drawing of it. Um, now you might be interested to know that your McCabe ancestors, the origin of the name um, is actually from this area. Um, the McCabes are believed to have been mercenaries, uh, they, well they certainly were mercenaries, a force of them from the Western Isles. In Ireland, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but th they came from this area, so they this might be partially why you appear to have a significant Pictish uh, DNA. Um, and uh, but there's a fascinating story about uh, these megalithic cultures and where they may well have come from. Um, look, you're going to have to read about that. There's links here. You can 
discover all about them. I should say that uh, Scotland uh, kind of formed along a similar lines to England in that uh, England, it was the Anglo-Saxons who lended their name to the country, uh, even though they weren't the biggest group. Same thing in Scotland, the uh, the Scotti from the, the north of Ireland, though their actual origins are much more mysterious and ancient than that. Uh, they formed a um, kingdom called Dalriada here, uh, which is a Gaelic kingdom, that's a language they spoke, um, and uh, that in turn led to a union with the Picts, possibly through uh, marriage. Um, and they joined with the, the Angles of uh, what became Lovian and struck the Kingdom of Strathclyde. And it's interesting that uh, uh, Ancestry is saying 40% and initially that seemed a bit too much. Uh, but in reality, that is in fact what uh, your, your living DNA works out to about. So now we get to uh, Ireland proper or, or the native Irish. Um, now this is family tree DNA. Very different from the others. It doesn't even mention the UK. Um, I'll get to why that might be in, in the relevance of this this section down here uh, once we get to ancient DNA because it is genuinely interesting. But as you can see from um, the others, there's quite a lot of variety. We've got ancestry only eight uh, percent. We've got uh, living DNA, which to be fair, they say seventeen point five, but really it's not much of much use. Uh, they're they're still in the process of. Uh, of uh, completing uh, their Irish project, as they call it, and uh, it looks like COVID got in the way of that. So really, the 23 and Me is the is actually the best place to look at for Ireland as things stand, uh, and their map is interesting. Um, and if we extrapolate from that, the regions which uh, you have the most DNA in, we can really learn a lot because the story of Ireland really is all about the uh, the people who invaded it because the Romans didn't invade Ireland and the Anglo-Saxons didn't do a huge amount here either uh, the result was that the Irish just were not ready they weren't unified uh, they, were, they were they were traders they were quite happy out and uh, the Normans who were the most efficient fighting force of their time even though they were relatively small they swept aside the Anglo-Saxons so really the, the Irish had no chance and that's what happened here so that's the story of how Ireland lost its independence um, and you know those Irish chiefs a lot of them did keep their power uh, and so but unfortunately what that meant was they were just relentless power structures in Ireland all fighting it out for supremacy so the earls were fighting it out and as a result uh, your potentially your ancestors the McCabe's were among those invited in from the Western Isles as mercenaries to help duke it out between these local lords um, and you can read more about that here or in this book which is a good read the bottom line is we just don't know because uh, we don't have records for your family in Ireland and that's not unusual for people who moved to uh, the United States before the, the mid 1800s because of a civil war in, 19, in the 1920s which destroyed most of the records or a lot of the records anyway and other ones are, are, are quite hard to read and find um, so there's Mayo your next county, according to this, is County Donegal, which is technically an Ulster, though it's part of the Republic of Ireland now. Uh, this was, again, a majority Irish county, especially down here. A lot of these people moved to Scotland, by the way, and then to America uh, during the potato famine. And that might be the case if your McCabe ancestors or, or indeed any of your other Irish ancestors came from here. What's interesting is look at this. This is the map of the Great Potato Famine and the percentage of people who actually left Ireland at that point. Donegal up here was actually the worst impacted in Ulster. So it tells you how bad things were around this area. So if we take the information of looking at where the native Irish were living, we can see that clearly the majority of your ancestors, according to 23andMe anyway, were in native Irish counties. Dublin, a bit like London, any major city, there's an attraction point for everyone. So that's going to be mixed DNA, which so it could mean exactly the same thing. Or it could mean you had ancestors there. But if you did have ancestors there, they were very much under the English administration and they could have been English or Anglo-Irish. So where do we go from here? Well, really, there's not much to add to your Irish um, DNA because we simply don't know where they, they lived because we don't have the records. Clearly, uh, you came from some, some very uh, strong Irish parts. Of, of Ireland, as, as silly and strange as that sounds. But it's time to go backwards and look really at the, the beginning, your ancient origins, and just start here. 
So we're beginning to look much further back than regular DNA can glance, uh, and what you can see here is basically Europe at the, the, at the largest extent of the last ice age, so about 30,000 years ago, something, something like that. Can't even see Britain and Ireland, they're completely under a mile of ice, most of Europe uh, in the north is, uh, and what you've got are humans kind of hiding out in Spain, in the ne uh, Neanderthal down here in caves, unfortunately this is one of their last stands, this is where they seem to have died out at the end of the last ice age. And it seems like your ancestors were basically among the very first people who were in these refuges, basically moving back into Europe as that ice melted about um, 15 to 11,000 years ago. And in fact, you can see that here. So this is, uh, this is basically Britain and Ireland, almost like, almost looks like a pregnancy with Europe giving birth to the British population and those British populations are moving into to Ireland after that. Uh, and it's actually a pretty good metaphor because it is exactly what happened. And then another group moved in from this part of Spain. That's known because bones found in Ireland um, have shown genetic links to the peoples who lived in this area at that time. And then later on, the same location, but a very different world, moving into into Britain as well and uh, Ireland keeping more of a connection here and one of the big differences between Britain and Ireland is more from here and, and more from here so that's that's one of the, the differences in terms of the farmers at least. So who were the earliest people in these groups? Well they were known as the Aurignacian culture and that was around 47 to 41,000 years ago in terms of uh, the evidence that we've found to date. Now the latest evidence suggests that your mother line, uh, I4A, basically developed in the Near East and then spread during the period we're talking about here into Europe as the ice sheets melted. And you can see that the genetic legacy of this group uh, are basically among the people we have been talking about. So here's your mother line here, and as you can see it's strongest in the Near East. And then if we go to uh, a map of Europe today, the actual strongest remnant of that genetic structure is on Kirk Island in Croatia uh, and also in the Carpathian Mountains and the Lemko Rusin culture of, of that region. So if we go back to your family tree DNA map, we'll remember we were a bit perplexed by this, but, but the fact is the last remaining strong remnant of your mother line in Europe is in this area here and in the mountains along here. So it's a plausible story. Your father line is represented by the first peoples of Europe who started acting f like fully modern people. They were traders. So who are these L21 people? What do they represent? Well, the answer is the Bell Beaker culture. Uh, and they're an interesting group. They're not the people who built the megaliths. They're the people who came in after them. Uh, they may have made some adjustments as evidence they adjusted Stonehenge for instance uh, for their own they were more sun worshippers uh, they had a different kind of way of looking at things uh, but they certainly knew how to trade and uh, that they did uh, and rather than being a single ethnic group uh, they were basically a single idea which spread through Europe like wildfire uh, where the kind of centralized command that led to these huge megalithic structures of the past, that all vanished overnight virtually um, and led to a vast expansion of trade. So you can see here one of the best features of family tree DNA, which is ancient European origins. It shows majority hunter-gatherer DNA followed by farmers and not a lot of the last major wave of uh, migrations uh, in, from Asia into, uh, into Europe. Um, but we want more detail than this, and that's where uh, GEDmatch comes in. And what it tells us is actually very instructive. So we can see here, it says for a start that um, you've got 53.14%, that's a lot, Baltic hunter-gatherer DNA. So that's the regions we've already identified up in the north. But in fact, the Baltic hunter-gatherers, the vast majority of people in the Baltic region, far more than any other Europeans, uh, are related to West European hunters. So these are the same people basically. But this uh, chart here actually breaks it down further showing um, ancestry which is Natuvian. Natuvian being um, not quite farmers but settling down in the beginning of that transition uh, with this group here, the Mediterranean farmers. Uh, they are a kind of second generation uh, group of Near Eastern far farmers. 
and they're related to an earlier group, which is the Anatolian farmers. So the message is basically that you have ancient hunter-gatherer DNA, the first settlers in Europe, and the first farmers. Now, what else does this mean? Well, it means, of course, that your ancestors, without question, would have bumped into the Neanderthals, uh, the world's most misunderstood artists, as a New York Times article put it in 2018. And no wonder they got on well with those early humans, because they were excellent artists and musicians, both sides, uh, in their own right. And there's that final proof of your uh, ancient DNA. 89% of 23andMe customers have less Neanderthal DNA than you. Than you. So to summarise, at the end of this report, you have some of the oldest DNA in Europe and in Britain and Ireland, and you have early settlers in colonial America. Pioneering and wanderlust are clearly in your bones. Thank you for putting your trust in my origins and allowing us to explore your family story. You can follow the links below on this video or visit myorigins.co.uk to learn how to further future-proof your family story. You can also leave comments on this video below.